Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I want to say a quick thank you to my guest from last week's episode, Kenny Etchison, the artist rep for both exotic guitars and effects and also Taylor guitars. If you didn't get to hear it, you can listen to all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it or download our app and take us with you. Also, be sure to tune in next week to hear my conversation with guitarist, singer, hit songwriter Ray Parker Jr. You're not going to want to miss that one. I'd like to take a moment to also thank the companies that help me sound my best, whether I'm performing live or in the studio recording and producing music. Blue Microphones, Taylor Guitars, Duesenberg Guitars, Seymour Duncan Pickups, Mesa Boogie Amps, Diodario Strings and Planet Waves, Motu Digital Performer, IK Multimedia, Fishman Acoustic Amps, and Exotic Effects. So often I get asked questions about the creative process. So I created this show to focus on what it takes <clears throat> to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music, to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is guitarist, compo- guitarist composer, producer Grant Geisman. Grant Geisman is a popular contemporary jazz recording artist, guitarist, and Emmy-nominated TV composer. The talents and gifts of this artist are as diverse as the many, many, many guitars he owns and loves. As a studio guitarist, he has recorded with such artists as Quincy Jones, Burt Bacharach, Elvis Costello, Brian Wilson, Van Dyke Parks, Gordon Goodwin's Big Fat Band, Paula Abdul, Ringo Starr, Keiko Matsui, David Benoit, Placido Domingo, Luis Miguel, Julio Iglesias, and Chuck Mangione. He has also played on the scores for such TV shows as Two and a Half Men, Monk, Mad Men, Touched by an Angel, and Dawson's Creek. His film credits include Because I Said So, Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, The Majestic, and Anaconda. Grant's discography of 15 solo albums has just a few of his friends playing along with him as special guests, including Chick Corea, Chuck Mangione, Tom Scott, Mike Finnegan, and Patrice Russian. He writes, arranges, plays, lives, and breathes music, modest and humbly happy to be following his first and only choice of profession for his entire career to date. Please welcome my guest today, Grant Geisman. Hey, Grant. Hey, Grant. Hey, how are you, Terry? I'm wonderful. Thanks for for taking the time to uh, spend the next hour with me and and our guest. Happy to be here. Yeah. So let me just jump right in. You've written three books for Mad Magazine and EC Comics, Collectively Mad, Tales of Terror, and Foul Play, the Art and Artist of the Notorious 1950s EC Comics. I grew up reading Mag mad magazine so i understand and and really appreciate your obsession i'm curious how did you end up being one of the country's largest collectors of mad magazine and 1950s ec comics memorabilia well i mean i you know i actually was reading mad before i ever picked up a guitar so i mean i I was reading mad like yeah like when i was like about eight years old which is fairly early really Mm -hmm. but i was i was shown the magazine by some kids that were few years older than me and i was like what is this you know (laughs) and um they're like well yeah mad magazine it's really funny and i'm like i was like like first of all i couldn't believe that something like this even existed and so i said well you know where do you get this and they're like well you know you can just go down to the drugstore and i was like they would sell this to me you know and yeah (laughs) it's good to buy it so you know and and when you're a kid a lot of the humor is is right down there where you can 
understand it. But a lot of the humor at that time in Mad was like kind of like this tantalizing glimpse into the real adult world. And, you know, like this kind of sure thing, was. like I don't, I'm not really sure what this is, but it's really cool. You know? Right. I, I don't think I understand this, but I know that I like it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, it was very um, sophisticated and funny. And so- and sophomoric at the same time. Totally. Totally junior was high school. <laughs> just totally sophomoric and stupid, but funny. Right. And then really sophisticated political satire and, you know, uh, movie parodies that a kid, you know, eight or ten year old kid would never see. Right. You know, and uh, just stuff like that. So I, I was always fascinated. Plus it had always had incredible artwork. Yeah, it did. Did you so, save your magazines, or or you went back yeah. later and no, oh, you did. Well, both. I mean, I saved all the stuff I had when I was a kid, right? Um, and then later, I went back even further and you know filled out the collection, and then started looking for really rare collectibles mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And then I, at some point, I amassed this pretty big collection, and I said, "There's a book sitting here, waiting <laughs> to be written that no one has done." Right. And that, that turned out to be that first book you mentioned, Collectively Mad, which is essentially the history of Mad Magazine and, to some extent, the EC Comics, as shown through their own collectibles. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the stuff was from my collection. And I interviewed people. I got to know Bill Gaines, the publisher. I interviewed mm-hmm. him for the book. And, you know, it just, you know, by then, obviously, I, I, I had a music career because that book came out in, like, 95. But this right. was just something different i always was interested in journalism and i never went down that road and and um it was just something fun that's creative but not music you right know? so yes it was just something different mm-hmm. i didn't know that about you until i i started researching uh your bio and and you know googled you and found out some fun things that i that i didn't know even though we've known each other for years so that was that was the first thing I wanted to ask you. Let's let's jump into music. You're probably as recognized for your guitar work on Chuck Mangione's "Feel So Good" as you are for the catchy television theme song that that you co-wrote with Lee Aronson and Chuck Lorre for Two and a Half Men." What was your path from j- jazz guitarist to Emmy-nominated TV composer? Oh, it's very simple. You just follow the dots and just go. You know. yeah, I mean, right. that's nothing a, to it. A, <laughs> yeah, nothing to it. You just start out at number one and keep going until you reach. Uh, you know, I mean, that's such a difficult question. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd have to go. Uh, first of all, I, I became fascinated with the guitar around age eleven, mm-hmm. or maybe even a little earlier, because there were some kids. First of all, there were some kids that had like a surf music band. You know, a surf band, a garage mm-hmm. band. Again, some kids a few years older than me, and they used to rehearse. And I used to, if I knew they were rehearsing, I would run home after school and go over there and watch them rehearse. This was and in was San like, Jose where you grew up? Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. San Jose, California. Yeah. And which is, you know, like about a half an hour over the hill from Santa Cruz. So like on yeah. KLIV, which is the local, you know, sort of pop station, top 40 station at that time, they would give you the surf reports, you know, back when I was a kid. Right. You know, surf, surf is up, you know, whatever. And so... So surf bands were kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, I would run home and watch them rehearse, and it would be like, you know, Fender Jaguar guitar. And I'd, I distinctly remember the the chrome with the sunlight reflecting off it. And it's like, man, this is really cool, you know? Yeah. So, and then when the Beatles came out in 64, I became fascinated with that. And then basically I bugged my parents for about six months to get me a guitar Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they they kept putting it off like ah he'll you know he'll outgrow this and I just kept bugging him and kept bugging him, so finally you know when that Christmas they they got me a guitar which would have been Christmas in 1964. So was that before your grandfather got you your um, your Sirius Stella guitar? Um, he bought the Stella after like so. You know I took lessons immediately and and then. Pretty soon, like, you know, I, I took um, lessons from a teacher that sort of taught you notes out of the book, like this is E and this is how it looks on the note staff and, right. you know, Alfred's, <laughs> Alfred's guitar method. Yeah, and I, I was like, I started. This, yeah. is, this is cool, but I want to learn rock and roll stuff, you know, and mm-hmm. she really wasn't able to do that. <clears throat> so I segued to another teacher and, um, you know, got better and, and, and whatever. And so 
once I started being able to kind of play, then my grandfather went down to Sears and he bought three identical um, Stella guitars from Sears. Mm -hmm. One one he gave to my cousin Katie, who had been toying around with the guitar a little bit. One Mm -hmm. he gave um, to me and then one he kept at his house so that I, if I popped over there, he could take out his banjo and the guitar would be sitting there and, you know, I could play it and we could play together. And that's what we did. Was he the only musician in your family, or were your parents musical as well? So, I mean, my my father was kind of was a professional drummer, sort of before World War II, and mm-hmm. then after the war ended, he never went back to drumming. But, I mean, I have a picture of him playing this trap drum set, you know, kind of with a 1940s tie on, next to a kind of a like a fake palm tree, in, you know, <laughs> in some restaurant he was playing in or something. So. Um, and then my grandfather was sort of an, basically an amateur plectrum banjo player, like the four mm-hmm. string. Um, and he absolutely loved it. He wasn't a great player, truthfully. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it brought but him great joy. An, an enormous passion for it. Like, he just absolutely loved it. And, you know, a lot of that rubbed off on me. Mm-hmm. So there is music kind of running through the family. But um, I'm the only one that really, you know, ever made try to make a career out of it but your parents encouraged you i i understand they didn't discourage you from doing they did music. not discourage me and actually after i'd been playing for i don't know a couple or three years i remember there was like probably in like an eighth grade they had like a um like a career day you know and they mm-hmm. could do this or you could do that and whatever and i came home and i said to my mom you know they had this career day and there's nothing that they presented that i'm interested in and she goes, oh, well, you like to play guitar. Why don't you just do that? And I was like, what? You, you know, That's you can fantastic. make money playing You can make <laughs> money playing the guitar? And she's like, well, yeah, you know, you could be a music teacher or you could play in the pit band at, you know, at the theater in San Francisco or you could be on a cruise ship. Like she just threw out all these weird things that you could right. possibly do. And I was like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do then. So that and was you it. Did. Wow. Yeah. That's so nice. That's that's so nice that you were encouraged and and actually steered towards that direction instead of away from living a creative artist life. Yeah, it was kind of amazing. Have have you passed that on to your daughter in in your family, uh, encouraging her to be creative? Yeah, but unfortunately, like she played piano for a while, and then mm-hmm. she played wanted to play guitar when she hit about sixteen. I want to learn guitar. But it's, you know, after six or eight months of each thing, it would be like, ah, I don't want to do this. And it just broke my heart because she's super musical. Right. Like she's got a great ear. Like she really could have done it. Mm-hmm. But, it's, you know, sometimes kids today aren't willing to put the work in, you know. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I've kind of noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's really, it's a different time. You know, yeah. Because um, we were we were taught that if you want something, you need to work for it. Period. Yeah, and yep. and it turned out to be true. You know, oh, the, yeah. those of us that are successful and and um, and get to do what we really love, uh, you know, put in a lot of hard work to get here. But it certainly has paid off, and and not just financially, but um, artistically and emotionally and creatively. And you know, mu- yeah, music can be such an incredible emotional release that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what we do is a special thing, for sure. And, it, yeah. you know, it does take, you know, I, the whole 10,000 hours thing. I don't know if it's really 10,000 hours, but it's a lot of hours. Right. It takes you to get to the stage where, you know, you really are connected with the music and there's this emotional thing that happens. And um, But it's it's worth it, for sure. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to congratulate you on your Emmy nomination for the, the theme for Two and a Half Men and and bring attention to that you've written music for 247 episodes of two and a half men and 118 episodes of Mike and Molly. Are you exhausted? <laughs> That's a lot of music. No, I mean, first of all, it's, it's, I, I co-wrote all that stuff. So, right. you know, the, with uh, Dennis was Brown to do with, with my partner. Yeah. Dennis C. Brown. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, in that way, it was really nice. And also, you know, these are sitcoms. They're not like 60-minute dramas with wall-to-wall music every right. week. And so it's it's a really very nice schedule. 
you know, sometimes it's not the amount of music you have to write. It's like if you had to play piano on the set or something or go teach someone how to sing, then right. you'd have to be at all the rehearsals and all the run-throughs and go for the shoot and all that. So it was really not the amount of music, you know, like the minutes. It, a lot of times it was just the amount of time that you had to be there. But I'm but, not and, complaining, and, but, you know. No, it doesn't sound like you are. And, and in a way, that's kind of refreshing that, that they have enough respect or understanding of the importance of music that they would uh, require and encourage you uh, to to be hands on and on every aspect, not just sequestered in the studio, but actually on the set, making sure things look right and sound great. Yeah, I mean, even when they sh- we sh- you know the- we shot several versions of the theme as Angus T. Jones kind of got older and older mm-hmm. and older. So right. when they would do those reshoots, um, you know, they would want us on the set, you know, making sure the lip sync looked good and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and so they they really did a pay attention to little detail. Right. What's the you know something we we have a about a minute so I'm going to ask you and you can give a short answer in this but what's the process for co-writing music for a TV show how do you, how do you and Dennis C Brown collaborate and we've got like 60 seconds before we hit okay, our first I'll, break. Okay, I'll make it quick. I mean sometimes it's literally the two of us sitting in a room together you know working out some little song they wanted us to do or something. Other times we each do our own take on it and take that in and present that. And then they pick whatever they want. And oh. invariably it was one or the other they were happy with. So then moved on to the next thing. So it, right. it worked out really well. And you're both guitar players. So you have a sort of a common point of view in a way. Yeah. But we both play other instruments. I can play some piano and so can Dennis and he, mm-hmm. he plays harmonica and he can play a little country fiddle. And, you know, so there's, Kind of the one one or two man band thing has really worked out for us. That's great. Yeah. Well, we're we're stepping into our first break. I'm here with my friend, guitarist, composer Grant Geisman, and we're going to be talking about a lot more of uh, what it takes to be you. <laughs> and, <laughs> so we'll be right back. Um, everybody, stick around. <laughs> Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on?
welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. You're listening to Grant Geisman, who's my guest on today's show. And uh, Grant, your music just makes me smile. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I have a good. I, I just get happy when I listen to it. You know, you. Um, I want to quote something that that you said. Your your album, Cool Man Cool, features, in your words, cool music. I like to play. Cool people. I like to play with. Yeah. And that clearly comes across in your music. I'm, I'm wondering, is that because you've had previous experiences playing uncool music with not so cool people you know yeah don't read too much into that i mean i always play with cool people Mm -hmm. and i try to make cool music but sometimes you know there's a guy at the label and he wants you to play cover tunes or you know and and then as you know with the the format that that sort of became the um the smooth jazz format you might have some guy, some radio programmer guy saying, well, you can't have a, a sax solo or a flute solo. It has to be this or it has or to be Or live that. drums. You have to have loops or, or what, machine. Yeah. yeah, whatever it is. And so, you know, I was not having any of that. So I mm-hmm. just want to play cool music that I like to play right. with cool right. people that I like to play with and not really take any kind of, you know, uh, editorial criticism from anybody. Yeah, especially non-composers, uh, you know, and, and right. artists. I I agree with that. It's it's uh and you know that's one of the things especially um you know the the further you've gone into being a successful TV composer the further it seems to have allowed you to be completely free in expressing yourself with your your records. You just like we were talking about the other day when we were working. You 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 just make the records you want to make. It's a and it's great fun, luxury. And have fun doing that, and it. you're absolutely right because it's you know the TV shows you know, have allowed me to make my last three records, which is kind of this jazz trilogy. Uh, the first one was called Say That, and then the, the second one that you mentioned, Cool Man Cool, and then the most recent one called Bop Bang Boom. And it's, yeah, essentially it's just whatever I felt like doing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's it's very liberating. And, and again, the TV shows have afforded me, you know, the ability to make these records. And not only musically, but just... The way they look, my friend Miles Thompson did all the artwork, and we did these cool inserts with liner yeah, notes. And, yeah. You know, say that has a little miniature chart of the title tune. And, mm-hmm. you know, there, uh, one album we did, like, removable tattoos with the artwork and stuff that. like that. I, I just, you know, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and, uh, you know, been very lucky to be able to do it because of the TV show. But then, you know, on your album, Say That, it it marks the return to uh, real jazz and, and you've got 13 original compositions and, and it, it goes back to the style of Wes Montgomery and Horace Silver and Jimmy Smith. And there's a great quote that I read from jazz critic, Bill Milkowski. And he yeah. wrote that say that is an iron fist upside the mushy head of smooth jazz and Grant Geisman's defiant declaration of independence. I love that quote. <laughs> I love that quote too. We actually yeah. put it on a sticker on the front of the record uh, because yeah. it's exactly right. I mean, you know, I, I made my share of albums that could be played on the kind of quiet storms, you know, smooth jazz format. And I like those records, you know, but again, it, the format just got narrower and narrower and more and, and more restrictive as to what you could do and what you could not do. And, um, it's kind of like it. It really became like this is not what I signed up for. You know, I right. I didn't get into music to have these kind of restrictions placed on me. I got into music to have fun and you know and try to explore 
music as best I could and, and stuff like that. So um, I love that quote because it really was, you know, I just decided, hey, what makes me happy? You know, what about jazz and jazz guitar makes me happy? And I, I started thinking back about those West Montgomery albums, West Montgomery and Jimmy Smith or the Horace Silver records where they were really cool tunes with cool melodies, but they were still playing on them and it was still jazz. And that's what I decided I wanted to do. That's what made me happy. So that's what I did. You know, I suppose that's what it is that draws me to your your most recent records. I mean, I, I always enjoyed your music. They, they were always fun to listen to. They were the co- compositions were compositions were interesting the playing was always great but there's there's just something uh, there's an abandon and and a freedom that that i hear in these last three records that's totally enjoyable oh thanks yeah you know your initial stamp on pop culture was your guitar solo of course on chuck mangione's 1978 hit feels so good what do you remember about that recording session just that it was pure happiness and joy <laughs> You know, um, Chuck had kind of gotten a new band together. The rhythm section, me included, you know, were from Los Angeles. And then he had his sax player, Chris Vidala, who was already in the band. And, but it was he kind of put a new band together. And we were on the road, you know, for, I don't know, six or seven months. And then it came time for him to make his next record. And, you know, he decided to obviously make it with the touring band. And um, I remember we did demos of pretty much all the album like went in the studio for a couple or three days and just threw ideas around Mm -hmm. um and then we went on the road for another three weeks or a month or something and we were playing that music every night and and uh, and and then in the daytime we were listening to these demos that we had made Mm -hmm. um and so by the time we got back into the studio a the band was on fire with the stuff and b we had kind of gotten so married to many of the things we did on the demos that most of us just kind of relearned our solos that we had played on the demos. Mm -hmm. I fixed up a couple things on the feel so good solo that I didn't Mm -hmm. like, but probably, you know, probably 85% of it was what I improvised. Um, right. And, and so that became the record. It was just pure fun and joy to do Mm -hmm. it. And I, and I think it sounds like that. Yeah, it does. You know, and it, and it really, it, it jumped out when there was nothing else like that going on in radio back then. You know, it really stood on its own. It fit within everything else, rock and pop and blues. And, you know, when, when radio was more open and you would hear more than one style on right. a station. But it still, it, there was something there. What's this instrumental piece of music that's, that's uh, tearing up the, the airwaves and, and makes sense to go from, you know, Iron Butterfly to Chuck Mangione and then, back to a Carlos Santana tune. And the funny thing is, you know, we didn't plan it that to be a, a ginormous hit. In fact, mm-hmm. the album version, I'm, I think it's like around seven minutes long. There's this whole rubato opening with Chuck playing the melody and I'm playing like a classical guitar yeah, chord that. underneath yeah. him. And then it finally, you know, the tempo comes in and mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. there's there's a gu- guitar solo and a sax solo on the record. And so, but, mm-hmm. but the label was able to figure out, well, if we make this edit, you know, we can have the first part of the guitar playing the melody and then we can cut to the second part of his solo and then right. we can get a single that can be played on, you know, current contemporary radio. And that's what they did. And that's what became the hit. Mm-hmm. But, you and know, we- it also had to do with it. Just Chuck was pretty much, you know, like relentless with regard to touring. I mean, when we were... You know, in those days, it would be like three or four weeks on the road and then back a week, three or four weeks on the road, back a week. So basically, you you know, it was nine months out of the year touring, if you added it all up. You know, that leads me to another question. How have you been able to balance career and family, or were you single back then? I was single in those days. Okay. So, and then later on, as you've, you know, you've had a busy career as a as an artist yourself and as a session musician and moving into TV composer, how do you balance work and family? Well, when I was doing a little bit of road work, I never did all that much road work with my own band, although I Mm -hmm. did some, Um, but it was never that kind of relentless, you know, nine months away kind of thing. So um, it wasn't 
you know, terrible. And then obviously when you're working on a show, you're still, you know, you're still basically home, although you right. know, you're working, but it's not mm-hmm. like you're disappeared for three weeks, you know, right. out on the road. So Right. So you can still come so out of was, your studio and have dinner with the yeah. family and then go back and hit the exactly. deadline. So, you know, like that's what I said before, like the, a sitcom schedule is a really nice schedule pretty much for everyone, the actors and, and right. you know, the writers and stuff like that, because it's, it's not 14 hour a day shooting, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it might be that long on, on like actual shoot day, like by the time you get there and whatever. But I mean, most, most days for the actors, it's rehearsal days and, you know, and stuff like that. And those days are not 14 hour days. They're just not. Right. So it's, it's a nice schedule for everyone. And when you left Chuck's band in 1981, was that a difficult decision for you, or did it just feel like the right thing to do at that time of your life? It kind of felt like the right thing because, the, you know, you, there was really no opportunity for advancement <laughs> in a way. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I was the guitar player in the band, but there was really no opportunity to write stuff or anything right. like that. Mm-hmm. But I kind of felt like I've, I've already done this. And, you know, I was a little sick of the road by then anyway, because it's pretty grueling. You know, even though after Feel So Good hit, we, you know, the travel started getting better, nicer hotels and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But still, mm-hmm. when you're on the road, especially we used to do a lot of one-nighters unless we are in a bigger city. So it's very hard. Like you play, you know, fairly late and then you have to unwind a little bit after the show. And then you'd have mm-hmm. to be at the airport usually at 8 a.m. the next morning again. Right. So. Right. It's pretty tiring. Yeah, um, and yeah. and even harder now, you know, with yeah, with well, yeah. Now they are. I mean, I I remember getting to the LAX, you know, this is in the late seventies, like with twenty minutes to spare, and I could just <laughs> zoom up to the gate and be fine. You know, right? Uh huh. Could never do something like that now. Although it was probably pushing it a little bit then. I, probably, but, uh, but that ship has sailed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I never missed a flight. <laughs> really ever no I, you know i haven't either come to think of it um well there, there's something to be said for that uh, although one time i i, <laughs> I did miss a flight one time there was a european tour uh-huh. and i get i get there plenty of time and i'm and gap mangioni chuck chuck's brother was on this particular trip and i'm you know we're all there and my stuff's all checked in and i'm talking and he's it's like so do you have your passport and i like and i just went white because <laughs> Oh, I forgot. Right. So anyway, they, you know, I they took me home and I didn't make it back in time to get on that flight. But they, mm-hmm. there was another mm-hmm. flight that got me in and plenty of time to get the gig. That's the only time mm-hmm. I've, <laughs> and I and I did not miss the gig. But that was a bit of a panic. Yeah, and I bet you that's the only time you ever left again without your passport. Yeah, you got that. That's the first <laughs> thing I check now. If I'm going overseas. <laughs> Um, I've, I've heard you say that you, you think of yourself as a young, promising guitarist. You still think of yourself that way. And I, I smiled when I read that about you. Why do you say that? Because I'm in complete denial of how old I am for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also truthfully, when you play music there, you're no particular age. Right. Like, like you're, I mean, uh, I've been, you know, knock on wood, I've been, fairly healthy. I don't have any kind of arthritis or something Mm -hmm. like that. So, so, you know, when I'm in there playing music, I don't feel any particular age. I feel the same as I've always felt, you know, and you kind of look the same, actually. Well, you know, not getting any younger, but you know, well, I'm I'm right behind you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's why I think that because I kind of have this, you know, um, delusional, (laughs) you know, feeling that I'm, I'm still 25. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I yeah, I'm turning sixty in a couple of weeks, so I I understand, you know, and it's I kind of chuckle. It, it just seems, um, like not a fit, you know, because of because of our lives of music and and yeah. how it keeps us playful. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and, and happy. Uh, I I know that um, you know, your first teacher mrs allen your first guitar teacher when you were 11 you started with her you know yeah. and then you went and studied classical guitar for six months in high school and and I well you're skipping you were... a whole bunch of, you're, you're yes. skipping a whole bunch of stuff but uh, the, my uh, second teacher was actually the guy that taught me all the rock and roll tunes uh, and his, right. his name was jeff levin 
and he mm-hmm. was in a very popular local band called People. Yes. With an exclamation point mm-hmm. in San Jose, and they actually had some records on Capitol, and including they had they had a hit on um, this tune called "I Love You," which was a Zombies tune. Yes. Which yeah. they covered, and it, they got you know they got pretty far with that song. But point being, you know, Jeff was the perfect guy for me at the time because he showed me up Beatles tunes and Jeff Beck licks and all this kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Right. And you were already playing in bands, right? Yeah, like or, garage bands. Yeah, garage you know, bands with, with your friends. and. Yeah. You, I, when, you've also said that when you started studying with, with jazz guitarist Jerry Hahn that your playing improved monumentally. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think created that profound shift in your playing I'm, in addition to just being ready to take it the next step. But what, what happened there? How did... Well, he, yeah. Jerry Hahn is, was a great teacher, and he had all these – he's kind of an avant-garde player in a way. Mm-hmm. He likes to take things outside, and he had all these really interesting kind of like quirky-sounding exercises, you know, with like, uh, you know, the Devil's Interval, the tritone stuff, and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and just all this cool stuff. That That's number one. And number two, he, he – see, when I was in high school – Pretty much my idea of a big band was like the Buddy Rich big band, which is great stuff. That's like yeah. in, in, you know, in high school, that's what we were all playing. Um, but I didn't know who, well, really, I didn't know who Jimmy Smith was. And furthermore, I didn't know who Miles Davis was. I didn't know mm-hmm. who Coltrane was. I didn't know who Ornette Coleman was. You know, so Jerry goes, he made this, he wrote out this little list of records. Well, you should go get this record and this record and this record. And then we started learning bebop tunes, you know, Charlie mm-hmm. Parker tunes and stuff like that. And, um, you know, just being exposed to all this stuff just opened my horizons up so tremendously that right. um, my playing just took a big leap because of working with Jerry. We're heading into our second break right now. So I'm, when we get back, and I'm here with, with guitarist, composer Grant Geisman, I want to talk to you about your time with Louis Belson's band, Gerald Wilson band, and how that prepared you being a professional musician. We'll be right back. This is Tim Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on InterTalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas, and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now, with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real time ADR work, remote recording, and overdubbing. And it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high quality audio and video connection over the internet for all of your production needs. You know what? What's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on InterTalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Are you Wednesday serious about your music? Pacific Are you Station ready to run with, with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beat, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Audio.com. 
Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. With my guest Grant Geisman, and that's uh, which piece is that, Grant? That's called Chicken Shack Jack, and that was with Tom Scott. Tom Scott, yeah, the yeah. the very um, easy to recognize Tom Scott. Uh, he's fun. He's what a guy. He's really. He's just got a groove that you can drive a truck through. You know, I'm not kidding. I mean, yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's like he's like a rhythm section player. You know, he is. yeah, with with his yeah. really funky and soulful and mm-hmm. all the all the stuff you want to have. Yeah, and, and it was so fun. Of... Have... I I'm mean, sorry, I was going to say it was so great to have him on um, my Cool Man Cool record because you know a lot. Of, I would get records that were made in L.A. and I, you know, like you, I'm sure I I would read the liner notes and I knew who Tom Scott was and I knew who John oh, Guerin absolutely. was. Yeah, and I knew who Larry Carlton was and. And, um, you know, I, I knew who these players that were down here in L.A. were. And um, basically, it was like, I got to get down to L.A. because it's only 300 and whatever, 325 miles away from San Jose. Mm-hmm. And that's where all this stuff is happening, all this stuff right. that I love, you know. So um, that's what I did. I came down here with the excuse to go to Cal State Northridge to study mm-hmm. music. Really, I wanted to just get down here. Um, did was your did you want to be one of those names on the back of the record? I know I, I did. Absolutely did. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That's why I moved out here too. Yeah. A, a little bit further. I can't, I drove from Miami, but but with the same <laughs> yeah. thing. Just reading those album credits. You know. I and as a matter of fact, I I'm curious about you. I never intended to be an artist. You know. I wanted to be the the non recognizable uh, face, but the name that everybody knew. So was that the same for you, or did you always know that you wanted to be an artist? I, and- I, wanted, to, I wanted to do both. I wanted to be a session guy, and I also wanted mm-hmm. to do my own music, whatever that mm-hmm. was. You know? And, um, I mean, really, like I came here when I was 20, and I was right. writing these really awful kind of jazzy pop songs, sort, but not mm-hmm. really jazzy, but sometimes with a major seventh chord or something, <laughs> you know, and like really awful music. But then once I got down here, I started – you know, writing stuff that was instrumental and more sophisticated and, um, and like that. So that's when I, you know, I wanted to be a session guy and I also wanted to, um, you know, record some of my own music at some point. And did playing in Louis Belson's band and Gerald Wilson's big band help prepare you for that? I mean, in some way it was just great experience. And the, the way I got to play with both of them is, is because of Cal State Northridge. Mm-hmm. Who had a you know smoking jazz band program at the yeah. time, which meant a that a lot of composers would bring their big band charts in, and t- to have the band play them so they could hear them before they were, you know, whatever put in front right. of whatever the professional situation was. Mm-hmm. That's a. and then B. Gerald Wilson was teaching a history of jazz class at Northridge, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and Gerald would sort of scope out who the good players were. And he would say, hey, can, can you put a little combo together to come play in the class on Thursday night or whatever it was? Right. So, you know, he did ask me to do that a few times. And because mm-hmm. of that, he's like, well, why don't you come play with the band? And it's like, what? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know? And um, Gerald's band was great. It, I mean, for a big band, it was very freewheeling. And I remember, you know, there, you'd look through the book and there'd be maybe, you know, 25% of the charts would be missing. And then, mm-hmm. so you'd have to just by ear figure out what what you're playing. You're know, like, okay, right. it's like, right. sounds like it's in D minor, and then okay, I guess it sounds like it's going here. And on sometimes 
this tune that you were just totally faking, he'd look over and point at you and it's time to take a solo, you know? So it was just incredible, mm-hmm. like throw you in the deep end and, and sink or swim time, you know? Right. But you, you've always been comfortable improvising. That's something that, that I understand you just had a natural um, inclination to do when you were younger. Yeah, kind of. It always just kind of made sense. Like, oh, I can make these little melodies out of these scales and stuff like that. You know, and then obviously when I became more sophisticated, like working with Jerry Hahn and stuff, you know, I had a lot more tools Mm -hmm. to use with improv. But I was always able to kind of be musical when I improvised, Mm -hmm. even if I didn't always know, you know, the most sophisticated stuff to do. It was always kind of musical, I think. And did you study conducting at Cal State Northridge, or was that something you started learning back at Danza Junior College? Uh, I, I don't think I learned much of that. At I think that was all Northridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Danza had a very good jazz ensemble for a for like a junior college, you know, up in San Jose. Mm-hmm. But it was you know it was like a rudimentary kind of musical education, you know the right, be, you know beginning theory and beginning music history and stuff like that. And I knew nothing about classical music. I mean, I'm talking absolutely nothing. Right. So, you you know, even at junior college, you would go take kind of an aptitude test and they would play stuff and you'd have to try to see if it was Bach or Beethoven or Mozart mm-hmm. or Stravinsky. I didn't have the slightest idea. I didn't. I had never heard any of this stuff. I didn't know what they were talking about. Mm-hmm. So I had a lot of catching up to do with regard to that. But you evidently went to uh, – uh, you chose a great school. Yeah. And and again, Northridge, you know, they had very good teachers. They had a great big band uh, program. Joel Leach mm-hmm. was the director at that time. And again, just the proximity to Hollywood was right. just invaluable. Absolutely. You know? Because you could kind of start getting going like – you know, you just get recommended for stuff and – one thing leads to another, and then you're hired to play a jingle, or you're hired to do this, or hired to do that. And um, that's how I started getting going. Let me ask you a couple of questions that are that are about life and and music. Uh, in, in either one, this doesn't have to be music related. What is the best advice that you were ever given? You know, I I once took um, a seminar. It was called Camp Concord. It was up in Concord, California. Mm-hmm. And it was Louis Belson and um, Barney Kessel and a bass player named Milt Hinton. And they, it was like a probably like a one week jazz camp. And they would, mm-hmm. you know, they would teach you stuff. They would do seminars and, you know, just what you would imagine a jazz camp to be. And, um, you know, the best advice I was given is that. What they said there is, you know, music is very important, but make sure that's not the only thing you have in your life. You know, mm-hmm. make, you know, get a hobby or, or you know, or, or get interested in, in art, like fine art or whatever, you know, some kind of something else. So right. that music isn't the only thing you can think about or talk about or experience, you know, and mm-hmm. that really was that really that came from Barney Kessel. Wow. And I, I have that's to say crazy. that was pretty much the best advice I ever got. And what's the best advice that you've ever given someone? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm asking the wrong person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have to ask someone else. Maybe I right. give them really <laughs> awful advice. Somebody on the receiving end of Grant Guy's yeah, exactly. stellar advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what are the things that you're most proud of in your life? I mean, I'm pr- I'm proud of it all, really. I mean, first of all, t- it takes a, a certain kind of hubris to be a kid growing up in San Jose to think that I could come down to L.A. and carve out some kind of a niche for myself. Yeah, you're not kidding. So, mm-hmm. so you know, just on that level alone, I did come down here and I did carve out some kind of a niche. And, um, you know, I somehow did that, you know. not and I'm not the most famous guy there is, you know, I'm whatever, but I, I managed to sort of carve out a career in music. And, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I don't think about this that much, but truthfully, 
now that I think about it, I am very proud of that. I think that's something to be proud of. I mean, we, you know, those of us that um, have some sort of uh, visibility and notoriety, you know, from doing this for so many years, that's at some point we had this fearless uh, idea that, that we were capable of and deserved to be on the radio, you know, and, yeah. or, and tour with people and, and, uh, or be good enough to be hired to actually play professional music. I mean, just right. that alone. Right. And, it, you know, that's not, you know, I don't see that as a cockiness. I mean, I certainly see that in some musicians. I, I've never seen that in you. It's not something that I experienced. It was just, I think it's this burning desire that, you know, al- alleviates the fear. And you just go do it because you want it so badly. Yeah, exactly. And, but you have to do your homework. Like, like you know, you, oh, yeah. I've always pretty much been able to do what's asked of me. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the good news. Right. Because you don't want to get in some situation professionally and just totally suck because, you know, that is just not good. (laughs) Right. You know, there's, um, (laughs) speaking of not sucking, (laughs) your recording of the, your song Texas Shuffle that you, you recorded with Albert Lee and Larry Carlton I know that yeah. you told your engineer that you reserved the right not to suck, <laughs> meaning that you yeah. wanted to do, well, go ahead. You, you talk about that. <laughs> well, I mean, so Larry Carlton lives now in, uh, in Nashville mm-hmm. and Albert Lee, he lives kind of in town here, but he's not always available and, and stuff like that. So we recorded, unlike literally all of the other songs on that album and, and on the other two albums, th- those songs for you know, except with the exception of Texas Shuffle, all those songs were recorded live in the studio with a band and all the solos were live and stuff like that. But because, you know, I knew I couldn't get Larry in the studio right there with me, we just recorded a track for that tune. Right. right. And, and I played, let's see, it was, no, it literally was just a track. And then I came back and I, I, um, I mocked up the three guitar parts. It's the, the piece is like a melody harmonized for three guitars. Right. So I mocked up the, the melody, and then I played my own solo, but I would have to count, like, okay, this is my solo, and then now I have to wait. This would be Albert's solo, and now this will be Larry's solo. Right, leaving and space now for yeah, Now we're going to trade artists. fours, and I'll play four bars, and now I'll wait eight. That's Albert. I'll wait another, whatever it was. That's Larry. And so it was very confusing to try to record it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but what that meant was, you know, I could send him this tune and say, would, would you be willing to play on this? I could show him what it would be like. The spaces were there for where they would play. And, and they both said, yes, you know, so, um, you know, I sent Larry the tracks and he put his solo on and then Albert came over and recorded in my studio. We worked on it together, but, um, it was just a really fun thing to have done. And of course, Larry, you know, like I mentioned earlier, is one of the guys that I was listening to, like, who I felt just had an amazing approach to how to record in the studio, like tasteful right. guitar playing on records. Mm-hmm. Like you know, how do you kind of approach something like that? And then, so, right. and I, right. you know, I've known Larry for, we used to hang out at Valley arts guitar and whatever. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. to have both Larry and Albert on that track was just such a, a joy, but I did the way it was recorded. I did reserve the right to not suck, meaning I reserved the right to re-record my solo again if I don't like it. Like, in other words, if they come back and just I sound terrible in comparison, right? I reserve the right to fix it, but I didn't. I, it I ended turns up out getting... that you're right. Your original guitar parts are what ended up on the record. Yeah, exactly. You know, and when when I listen to that song, it sounds like you all had a blast playing on that track, and and it feels like you are playing together because I because you gave it so much thought and you cast it well. Good. You know, you, That's you, good to hear. Yeah, yeah. It feels like you're all in the room together. It, it actually does. Yeah. I was kind of surprised when mm-hmm. it all was put together. You know, I'm actually not. You know, because <laughs> of everything that you just said. You know, it would it would make sense because you were very thoughtful about it and open. So yeah, it's a very cool track. Yeah, it's you know, fun. We're, believe it or not, we're getting towards the end of our conversation and before oh, we were it, so. <laughs> it is so sad these are the fastest hours in my life 
Yeah. Because they're really fun for me. It's 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 just um luxurious to sit down and talk with with friends and and share our stories with um other artists and musicians and and fans. Um you know to give them a a perspective of what our lives are about and what it takes, you know, to to really um have a career, you know, and and have a good life while you're doing it. So here's my question for you at at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Hmm. That's a, that's a good one. I don't, I don't know. What would I tell my younger self? I would say, you know, be careful what you wish for. I would say that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But you have no regrets. No, I don't. I mean, yeah. No, I really don't have any regrets. I mean, there's probably little things I might have rethought or done differently if I had, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, of course. Mm-hmm. But in general, you know, it's worked out pretty well. I, I really have no complaints, you know. Right. So far, so good? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. so where can our listeners find out more about you? Tell everybody your website and and everything else. I want them to go hear your music and, and know everything there is to know about you. Okay. Well, if they want to know everything, there's a Wikipedia page that has a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Not everything, everything, but um, my name's Grant Geisman, and Geisman is G-E-I-S-S-M-A-N. And um, my website is grantgeisman.com, and you can find out more there and hear some little music samples. And... You know, you can troll around the Internet and put my name up and look at some of the books I've done. There's actually a, yeah. a, a fourth book, which is uh, the biography of Al Feldstein, who was the editor of Mad Magazine for almost 30 years. And he was also one of the main architects of the 1950s EC comics, like Tales from the Crypt and stuff like that. So that's my m- most recent extensive book project. And that's out now? Yeah. Big coffee table biography of Al Feldstein. We are out of time, so sadly. Grant, I want to thank you so much for spending the hour with me. And everybody go check out Grant Geisman. Thanks, Grant. Thank you. It's great talking to you. for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wong. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. 
dropping beat, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. Pitbullaudio.com.